Hi, AJ here and welcome back to Contract B. Uh, in this video, we're just going to do a brief recap of what you did in Contract A and we'll move on to look at some of the key concepts for week one in Contract B. Uh, you will find a key concept video um, available for most weeks of this term. And these videos really aren't meant to be a substitute for your detailed reading from your um, text in your casebook. They are just um, little snippets, I guess, of explanations that you might find handy when you're reading your text or your casebook. So if you cast your mind back to contract A, uh, it might have been last term, so fresh in your mind, great. Uh, it might have been several terms ago. Uh, you will recall that you looked at the exciting and riveting factors surrounding formation of a contract. So you looked at things like offer, uh, acceptance, consideration, all important obviously. You had a look at things like the parties to the contract and whether they had capacity and so forth. You also had a look at uh, the terms of the contract itself. Uh, so was, was it was a term part of the contract or did it fall outside the contract? Was it a collateral term? Um, you also had a look at things like, well, was it really an important term of the contract? Was it essential to the contract? In which case it was probably a condition. Uh, it might have been a warranty, um, a mere term for which breach just entitles you to uh, damages but not to terminate. You had a look at these weird limbo land terms called innominate terms. Uh, you had a look at how to interpret the terms of a contract. So all of the, the things that are wrapped up in how to form and how to interpret um, a, a contract and its terms, these, these are all the riveting things that you had a look at in contract A. And I'm hoping they're kind of cemented quite nicely in the back of your brain because we're gonna to need to build on that platform now for contract B. So turning to contract B, um, we have a look at all the kinds of things that can, can go wrong with a contract. So just because you've got a nicely formed contract, you put a tick in the box for offer, acceptance, consideration, capacity, all of those good things that you had to look at before. However, the wheels have fallen off and something's gone wrong and the parties are now in dispute. And that is where us lawyers usually tend to step in. Uh, this term we are looking at vitiating factors, so the things that will unstitch a contract somehow. And uh, there's a wonderful world of things that can go wrong. We'll be looking at a uh, mistake today and then next week, week two, we'll be having a look at misrepresentation and misleading or deceptive conduct under the uh, Australian Consumer Law. Then we move on to have a little look at estoppel. Then we'll come back and have a look at duress, undue influence, unconscionable conduct. And rounding out in week five, we will have a little look at illegality. So that's a quick bird's eye view of uh, the first half of contract B. The last half of contract B will essentially be looking at um, performance, termination, breach, remedies that you can get, both at common law and uh, under statute and we'll be rounding out the course by looking at some international perspectives. So that's contract B, I guess, in a nutshell. And today, for the rest of this video, we'll be looking at the key concepts involved in the issue of mistake. So when we're looking at vitiating factors, and today we're looking at mistake, um, the first thing that you'll note when you're going through the textbook and the casebook will be a discussion of the remedies that are involved for um, that particular vitiating factor. And so before we actually leap into uh, the nuts and bolts of mistake, what I wanted to quickly guide you through was the various remedies that are available because those remedies in themselves have some fairly far reaching consequences. Okay, so the first thing that you will see is that a contract might be rendered void at common law. That's 
completely void, void ab initio or from the beginning. Um, this is an extremely serious consequence for a contract because essentially it means that it never gave the parties any rights in the first place. Okay, now if you think about that, uh, it has a fairly um, dire effect on third parties, innocent third parties. So where perhaps you might have had uh, a unilateral mistake, and we'll be talking about those in just a minute, one of the parties is mistaken, one is not. Now, in those situations, uh, often you have, uh, where you're talking about mistake as to identity, you will have a rogue pretending to be somebody else and uh, procuring goods quite often from the uh, innocent supplier and then the rogue runs away, sells those goods to an innocent third party and the legal action ends up being between the original supplier uh, who just wants to be paid and, well, now just wants their good, goods back um, and the ultimate purchaser who is equally innocent. Now, between those two innocent parties, probably that last third party intervener is the most innocent. Uh, they really had nothing to do with the whole issue that went on between uh, the original supplier and the rogue. Uh, so really you would think that they should be entitled to keep their goods. However, if that contract has been made void, uh, then there was never any title that passed to the rogue and therefore the rogue cannot pass title to that ultimate uh, third party purchaser, no matter how innocent they might be. So that is the fairly extreme end of what happens uh, when there are vitiating factors involved with a contract. Okay, so that's where the contract is void. The next conclusion that can arise where a contract has been tainted by a vitiating factor is that it's voidable. And here, uh, you don't have the extreme result that you have with void contracts, where they're void ab initio. You actually, the contract is still on foot. It's capable of being performed by both parties. Uh, however, one of those parties does have the right to elect to treat that contract uh, as at an end. Now, usually what will happen in those circumstances is that uh, the court will say that, that that party has the right to rescind the contract, okay? Now, rescission is a concept that basically involves unstitching the contract as though it never existed. Now, in those circumstances, what we have to do or what the court has to do is ensure that both of the parties are taken back to their original positions as far as humanly possible. We call this restitutio in integrum. That means you have to get those original parties to the contract back to, uh, you have to restore them back to their original positions. <clears throat> now being um, an equitable remedy, rescission is an equitable remedy, it's going to be vulnerable to a number of things like uh, latches, if you sit on your rights and you waste your time, or if you affirm the contract in some way, or crucially, if there is an intervention by innocent third parties. Okay, so where you rescind the contract, uh, you, or you have the right to rescind the contract, it must be done in a timely fashion and there can't be any of those intervening factors that might uh, destroy your right to rescind the contract. So there's a nice little case that we discuss next week in misrepresentation called Alati and Kruger, uh, and that involved some misrepresentations that went on in relation to the sale of a business. Um, now, what happened was the purchaser decided to stick on at the business and try and make a go of it, um, unfortunately, they, they dismally failed and ultimately the business was closed, the shop was closed and uh, uh, everything was wound up, assets were sold. Now, at that point, um, the court had to consider whether or not restitutio in integrum was possible. And um, in the bad old days, restitutio was a pretty strict kind of a principle. If you couldn't get the parties back to precisely their original positions, then it just wasn't possible and rescission was uh, ruled out as a remedy. 
Uh, however, in that case, which was a pretty important case, the court held that uh, what they could do is make orders um, in order to get the parties as close as they could to their original positions. So a court will make orders for uh, the restoration of, of assets from one party to the other party. They might require that certain sums of money get paid over. Uh, they will try and patch things up as close as they possibly can. And uh, that is the remedy of rescission and uh, the court's orders for restitutio. Uh, the next remedy that you'll see mentioned in the case book and uh, the text is rectification. And this can be um, a potential remedy for a number of different kinds of mistake. Uh, however, you have to be a little bit careful with this, um, as I guess with any remedy. Um, where you are asking a court to actually take out their pencil and cross out parts of a contract, or even probably more seriously, write in fresh terms into a contract. It's a very, very serious affair. And so the court will not do this lightly. So what you have to do, if, if there is a case of something like, for example, unilateral mistake, one party's mistake and one party's not, um, then you're, you're not going to get a court um, ordering rectification because rectification really is only available in those situations where you have the parties being at complete agreement as to the terms of the contract, but they've just written them down wrongly. And so you have the court being fairly confident they can then take their pencil cross out whatever's needed or put in whatever's needed according to what the parties have actually both intended that the contract should reflect. Now, it, um, the case that I'm thinking of was a unilateral mistake. It's called Frederick E. Rose, um, London Limited, and Will William H. Pym Jr. and Company Limited. Now, that case uh, involved um, horse beans and uh, a, a, a supplier who had contracted to supply uh, some feather rolls to an English company um, sought to source those feather rolls from an Algerian supplier in Egypt. And uh, he asked, uh, this was Rose, asked the um, uh, Algerian supplier what feather rolls were. And uh, the supplier simply um, answered that uh, feather rolls are just horse beans. So uh, Miss Rose contracted with Pim uh, and Pim supplied horse beans. However, the kind of horse beans were the issue in that particular case. What was originally sought was feather rolls. But what was supplied by the Algerian supplier to the uh, intermediary supplier, Rose, was uh, thieves. And these are an inferior kind of uh, horse bean than feverols. And so what uh, Ms. Rose did was that he brought a claim against the Algerian supplier um, to have the contract rectified and to have horse beans crossed out and to have feverols written in. However, the court said in that particular case, they couldn't order rectification because both uh, Mr. Rose and the Algerian supplier intended to buy and sell horse beans. And that's exactly what was in the contract. Um, they said it would have been different if Mr. Rose had alleged mistake or, and this is thinking back to contract A, if he had uh, argued that there was a collateral term that, in fact, the horse beans to be supplied were to be of the feverol variety. However, the, crucially, the pleadings in that particular case didn't reflect either of those arguments. Um, there was simply a request for rectification, and in those circumstances, the court was not prepared to order rectification. Uh, however, where you have something like uh, a unilateral mistake, for example, in Taylor and Johnson, where one of the parties has kind of tainted themselves with some uh, unconscionable conduct, 
um, and you've got a circumstance where uh, there is a mistaken belief by one of the parties, uh, the other party knows that the first party is mistaken. They don't correct that mistake. And here's the unconscionable bit, they'll probably get some benefit out of the other party's mistake or they'll cause some kind of detriment to the other party by the mistake. Um, in those circumstances, that kind of faint waft of unconscionability will actually prompt the court to come in with their blue pencil and um, correct the contract uh, according to uh, what good conscience would say that the contractual terms should be. So that is the remedy of rectification. Uh, the last few things, there's some mention in the textbook about uh, contracts being held unenforceable. Okay, now that is where uh, a court comes to the conclusion that, hey, there is actually a contract there and yes, it's capable of being performed and if the parties decide to do so, that's perfectly fine. But if they don't or if there's some kind of problem, uh, the court will not compel the other party to perform the contract. Um, usually something is vital that is vital to the contract is missing in those circumstances where a court concludes that it's unenforceable. And when we're talking about vitiating factors, you'll normally find that the court says that um, the contract is unenforceable because of a total failure of consideration. And that is where one of the parties just doesn't get what they bargained for. You know, there's, they're not actually getting anything back for the consideration that they've paid over. And in those circumstances, um, the contract just won't be compelled by the court. The other last kind of twin remedies are specific performance, where a court will actually order that a party must do something, usually perform their part of a contract. Um, or they will deny specific performance. And that's, again, usually where there's some kind of faint waft of unconscionable conduct uh, floating around the circumstances of the contract uh, that would make it inequitable for a court to actually make one of the parties do whatever it is that uh, the contract says that they should do. So they're your remedies. Keep the, the distinctions between those remedies in mind as you go through the text because they are very important, as I said, particularly as they impact upon innocent third parties. So if you go now to part two of our key concepts videos for this week, we'll have a little look at the different types of mistake, common mistake, mutual mistake and unilateral mistake. Thanks, guys.